We are going to continue on with photosynthesis. We've gone through the first part, which is uh, photophosphorylation. We are actually taking light energy and converting it into chemical energy that now we can do something with. And that do something with is kind of the part that you're more somewhat familiar with a little bit. That uh, is, hey, do a thing for me. Oh, you're not on. Uh, now do a thing for me. It is the Calvin cycle, where we actually take and integrate CO2 into organic molecules. And so this was named for the guy who uh, first characterized it, Melvin Calvin, which the rhyming in, in that name, I, Melvin Calvin, I like that. That, that just sounds so nice coming up my tongue. Melvin Calvin, Melvin Calvin. Anyways, uh, and this is going to happen in the stroma of the chloroplast, and it's what's known as the C3 pathway. We're going to talk more about why it's called that in just a few moments. It was discovered in 1945, and it won a Nobel Prize in 1961. So this is this is more like Nobel Prize worthy stuff that we're going to be talking about. And so what happens in the Calvin cycle is first, the major part is that we're going to get carbon dioxide is fixed and incorporated into a handful of different molecules that the plant needs to grow and become more planty. So carbohydrates, we're going to get carbon dioxide fixed into carbohydrates, amino acids, fatty acids, and nucleic acids. Although not all directly, some of that is going to be somewhat directly. And we're going to do that and power this process with ATP that we produce during photophosphorylation and the NADPH. down but no no you can stay in class oh, that's okay you, you. you I, I I think your time is very spent listening to my voice some more since you're gonna be missing it so much <laughs> yeah okay so principally we're going to be incorporating CO2 into organic molecules so we are going to and now in a really basic form here we're going to take a five carbon molecule which is organic a one carbon molecule which is the CO2 and between all that, we have six carbons, and we're going to make two three-carbon molecules from that. Um, if we get this into more detail, we're going to take a ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate plus a carbon dioxide, and we're going to make two molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate, or 3-PGA. And so... We don't have organic molecules to begin with. It's not like we can just take CO2 and spin organic molecules out of the organic stuff. We need to have organic molecules to stack it onto. Now, we again, we're making these two three carbon molecules, and this is why we call it the C3 pathway. It's the three carbon <coughs> molecule pathway. We make these three carbon molecules out of it. Now the actual fixation, the actual attaching of the CO2 into an organic molecule is going to be handled by this uh, enzyme, which is ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. Or it has a, has a simpler name, Rubisco. Peptides, one polypeptide is going to come from nuclear DNA, one from the chloroplast DNA. 
Rubisco is an interesting enzyme. It does some in interesting things. So, kind of like me, it is a slow enzyme. <laughs> oh, not an enzyme, actually, so that's different. Um, and it's only going to react three molecules per second. It, act it can actually only do its reactions thrice per second. That's not very much for an enzyme. This is, this is slow. But the thing is, is that there's lots of it. What it lacks for in speed, it makes up for we're just having tons of them. <laughs> there are not tons of me. There's only one. So I'm slow, but I'm also evil. So that, that. And so in the chloroplast, it's like 50% of the protein in the chloroplast is Rubisco. A ton. And in fact, over this is the most abundant protein on the whole Earth. There are 20 pounds of Rubisco on Earth for every man, woman, and child on Earth. If you had your own bag of Rubisco, you could have a 20-pound bag of Rubisco, and so could everyone else. And I don't know. It probably would not eliminate hunger if everyone had a 20-pound bag of Rubisco. 20-pound bag of Rubisco. <laughs> So that, that, that's a lot. There is tons of Rubisco all across the Earth because, A, it's slow, and number two, there are tons of things trying to carry out photosynthesis across <coughs> the face of the Earth. There's just a lot of those things. Anyhow, so, interestingly enough, the reaction that is catalyzed by Rubisco does not require an input of energy. It has a negative delta G. And so... What this means is the free energy, there is less free energy in the two molecules of 3PGA than there is in the ribulose plus the CO2, which is interesting. You might think, well, then, what in the world? Why does this happen? Well, it's because the whole cycle doesn't stop there. The whole cycle doesn't only consist of Rubisco catalyzing that one reaction. Yeah. So what, in the entire Calvin cycle, however, what you're getting released is not, um, 3PGA, or the 3-phosphoglycerate. What you actually get is, the Calvin cycle is eventually going to release glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. I'm going to put that up here, so I have to spell that later. It's going to use an ATP plus an NADPH, which might think, hey, well, we didn't take any energy. We'll come back to why you have to do that. And then that glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, we're going to move it into the cytoplasm where it can be used for other things. And uh, we're going to use phosphate co-transport. So we're going to move it along with phosphates, and uh, we're then going to use this glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to make other organic molecules. So for instance, do you guys remember anywhere else that you saw glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate so far? Not quite. Not quite. Glycolysis. So, one thing that you can potentially do is run this into glycolysis if you happen to want to, but you can also, all of those enzymes in glycolysis can run backwards as well. You get glucose out of that. Eventually what plants tend to make out of this is sucrose, which is the main transport carbohydrate in most plants. So once we do this, we have to regenerate the ribulose bisphosphate. And that is going to require some ATP. So 
again, to look at kind of like generally how this goes, skipping over some intermediate steps, you have three CO2, three ribulose bisphosphate, nine ATP, and six NADPH, and what we're going to get out is three ribulose bisphosphate, nine ADP plus phosphates, um, nine there, nine phosphates there, wait, yeah, uh, six NADP plus, uh, and then a DP plus, and then a glycerol to hide three phosphate. Again, we're skipping some intermediates there. <coughs> but the one thing that you notice here, is, well, expanding up the general thing, is we take three CO2, we get out, if we run this around enough times, glycerol to hide three phosphate from those three CO2. This, the ribulose bisphosphate, has to be regenerated. We have to keep that back out so that we can run it through Kalman cycle again and keep getting things out. Now, for every carbon that we're using, we have to use 3 ATP and 2 NADPH to actually fix that into CO2, or fix that CO2 into an organic molecule. Or for one glycerol to have three phosphates, since it's a three carbon molecule, 9 ATP and 6 NADPH. So let's look at this as like a as a diagram. Just a moment. Okay. We begin out here, up here. We have a ribulose one five bisphosphate and a carbon dioxide. Rubisco is then going to take this and make two three phosphoglycerin. One of those, and then essentially you run this twice this direction down here. And so for both of these, we actually run around and, and we get eventually converting that using an ATP and an NADPH. We are going to get a glyceraldehyde three phosphate. So now we've used two of these, one of these. Now we have two of these. So this is actually this. Phospho, three phosphoglycerate is actually what Rubisco spits out. But we convert those two into glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Okay, now we have two glyceraldehyde three phosphates. On average, one of those ends up getting exported so we can make things out of it. The other one is going to be go through a series of other intermediates, and we're not going to talk about the specific steps here, but we make it back into ribulose one five bisphosphate. And that is going to take another ATP to do that. We now have regenerated the ribulose one five bisphosphate. We can uh, react that with another carbon di dioxide, Rubisco, through Rubisco to make another two three PGA. And then we make those into both two glyceraldehyde three phosphates. One of those is <coughs> exported. The other one regenerates the ribulose one five bisphosphate. Does that make sense at that point? Is there any questions on this? Yeah? So that ADP, you get two of them because there's two of the... Yeah. And then you get one of the NADPH? Two of these. Because you're still... both All of these run twice. Oh, okay. So two here, two here. Because we're actually converting, th doing this step twice. Okay. And then, and then it's only one. This so is only one step here. Okay. Because one of these one of these glyceraldehyde three phosphates then gets exported so that we can make organic molecules, other organic molecules for that. The other one goes back there. So that's why you get, you get one, two ATP here, three ATP there. So that's how you get the three ATP. Then you get one, two NADPH here. And so for three times around, it actually take to net yourself a net one glyceraldehyde three phosphate. It actually takes three times around here to get the three carbon dioxide. Because this glycerol, to get this, you're actually sucking in more carbon here. So you actually have to run this around three times to net yourself a single glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Does that make sense? Yeah. Christian. Uh, how long does this process usually take for one, one cycle to occur? For one cycle to occur? I'm not exactly sure. I, I don't think it takes much longer than what takes Rubisco because I think Rubisco is the limiting step and the rest goes really fast. So like a third of a second for the cycle to happen. I think. I'm not very sure. Yeah, it's not it's not fast. But it's going a lot all the time. Yes. 
So, okay, so you have a series of other intermediates here where you get other molecules that are being then reacted, then you actually have them on carbons. I'm not totally certain of all these steps in here. That's, that's not one of them. Are there multiple enzymes involved? Yes, there are multiple enzymes. I think there's like another five steps in there. No. Questions on that? Can yeah. You go back a slide. I don't see how you get PATP into a eight out of five with foot six A. So like you get foot nine A takes nine out. Okay. Okay. So essentially, just thinking about this. Okay, you have um, so for one time around, you were going to use two here, right? Mm -hmm. Two of these here, right? Another ATP here. So how many ATP is that? Three. three. And how many ADPH? Two. Two. And you run this three times around to get to net three carbon dioxides fixed. Okay. You multiply all of those by three. So that gets you three times three ATP, which is nine, and two times three NADPH, which gets you six. Does that make sense now? Yeah, I think so. But like, so do you get a net benefit of ATP or do you not? A net benefit of ATP here? Like, did, does Calvin cycle like produce ATP? Yeah. No. No. Okay. no. Calvin cycle is using ATP. It's we're using energy to make this whole to, to fix carbon. Okay. It's a little bit yeah. weird because this actual step that actually does the fixing of the carbon dioxide doesn't require energy. It's the rest of the cycle that requires energy. And this ATP came from photophosphorylation. So essentially photophosphorylation gives us light to chemical energy. Then we use that chemical energy to take carbon dioxide and make organic molecules. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. No, I it makes sense. Okay. Okay, so once again. If we take three, we run this round three times, so we have three CO2 plus three, uh, three ribulose one five bits phosphate, nine ATP, six ADPH. We are going to net ourselves one glyceraldehyde three phosphate because again, it takes three carbons to get to this. Um, and so yeah, three ATP, two ADPH per carbon that we fix. So that that in a nutshell is Calvin cycle. But another thing also happens here, which is known as photorespiration. Photorespiration happens uh, all the time. It is one of these big things that plants just need to deal with. It's a biological flaw. It does not help the plant at all. It is a big problem for plants, and a lot of things that plants actually end up doing physiologically is to prevent photorespiration from happening or to mitigate the consequences of photorespiration. It wastes, it can up to some plants, it, it wastes 20 to 50 percent of all the carbon ATP and NADPH that a plant does, that it, 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 it can gain, and it gives it nothing back. Photorespiration is a big Okay, the reason that photorespiration happens is because Rubisco's active site also works with oxygen instead of just carbon dioxide. So it can re react to ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate with oxygen instead of ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate with carbon dioxide. In fact, weirdly enough, it does that slightly better than the carbon dioxide. And this is a bad thing. You do not want to be doing that. This will happen, therefore, anytime if you have a CO2 concentration that is low and oxygen is high, Rubisco, instead of doing the whole uh, reaction that we just talked about, it reacts these to a uh, ribulose. It takes a ribulose one five is phosphate plus an oxygen. It makes one of one three PGA one three phosphoglycerate, but then it makes a phosphoglycolate as well, and that has to get recycled. 
we can't do anything with phosphoglycolate. To kind of put this back into terms that we very first started with, in this case, we have a five carbon molecule. We're adding a zero carbon molecule, oxygen, or O2. And we get one three carbon molecule and a two carbon molecule, which is a phosphoglycolate. So that 3PG, we can still use it, kind of. We still can use it for the thing. Now the problem is, is this doesn't actually help you fix carbon because we need two of these made to actually regenerate the ribulose one five bis phosphate to keep running Calvin cycle. And so in this case, we actually can't can't do this. The fossil glycolate, however, has to be recycled. And that comes with a cost. It actually is, takes energy to do that recycling. I think, well, why can't we just use it for something? Well, there's a couple of reasons we can't use phos phosphoglycolate for things. Number one, phosphoglycolate is toxic. So you're actually making something that is going to hurt you. Uh, one of the ways that it's toxic is it actually inhibits glycolysis. So the enzyme triose phosphate isomerase is inhibited by phosphoglycolate. And it can shut down glycolysis. And then if you shut down your glycolysis, you're kind of up a creek. You might think, well, hey, it can get your energy from blood. Well, you might still use glycolysis to actually produce ATP. They still use Krebs cycle. They still use mitochondria. That's still important. Because this makes a C3 molecule and a C2 molecule, sometimes it's referred to as the C2 cycle, although I don't hear that nearly as much as just photorespiration. You want to think of why we call this photorespiration, by the way? In what way? We're consuming oxygen and doing this. So this actually, if, you're, if you have a plant that's undergoing photorespiration or it's somehow, that's actually using oxygen just as if you were running, or looking like as if you were running electron transport chain and using oxygen. Well, this still uses oxygen. You were still consuming oxygen to run this thing. So in order to mitigate photorespiration and recycle the phosphoglycolate. We're going to use peroxisomes, which we're going to come back and talk more about later on in the quarter. But it's organelle called peroxisomes, and we also have to use the mitochondria to recycle that phosphoglycolate. And this whole process is really slow and really energetically expensive. And we have to, generally we have to do this, all this recycling in fairly close proximity to the photosynthetic tissue. To give you a brief kind of overview of how this happens, of how the recycling happens, is we take two fossil glycolates, in the chloroplast, these, that's where they're made. These phosphoglycolates have to be exported to the peroxisome. 
where they get made into glycines. The glycines then get exported to the mitochondria, where they are combined, you lose the CO2, and you make a serine out of two glycines. Hence, we're using oxygen, we are producing CO2. You are losing, and also, if you think about the entire process up to this point, you took a ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, you took an oxygen, you made a phosphoglycolate out of it. In the process, so we got, we got no fixation of <coughs> CO2 at this point. And we're actually now losing <coughs> this CO2. In fact, we're losing CO2 from organic molecules in the recycling of the phosphoglycolate. So we get serine. The serine then gets exported back to the peroxisome. So we went to the chloroplast of the peroxisome, from the peroxisome to the mitochondria, from the mitochondria back to the peroxisome again, which we go through several steps here. And using ATP, we take that serine and we make a 3PGA again, which gets exported back to the chloroplast. So eventually, we get 3PGA. It took two phosphoglycolates to get it. We lost the CO2 and we lost an ATP in the process. So, what happens are, is that that 3 ATP and the 2 NADPH that we used in the Calvin cycle originally to run it once around, we've lost that. We haven't been able to really produce anything for running Calvin cycle that time. We also lose CO2 because of the recycling of the phosphoglycolate, we're losing CO2 in that process. And we're sinking energy into this, so we use energy to fix the CO2 in the first place, like to run the entire Calvin cycle back around this. We are using CO2 to fix CO2 in the first place, and then we're losing CO2, so we're losing all of that, and then also it takes an additional amount of ATP just to recycle. Well, the respiration is not good. But it happens a lot. Most plants are going to lose somewhere between 20 to 50 percent of all their fixed CO2 to further respiration. In hot, dry environments, plants have to avoid water loss. You can't just be in a hot, dry environment and just let your water pour out of you. So plants instead have to close their stomata. Stomata are openings on generally the underside of leaves that allow gases to get into and out of the leaves. But as you let gases into and out of the leaves, water goes with it. Water vapor goes with it. Just like you, if you're breathing a lot, you're losing a lot of, a lot of water. Plants do the same thing. The more that they exchange gases with the environment, or as long as you breathe, the more they are going to lose water. So they have to close their stomata to keep from losing that water. So what happens there is inside the plant, if you're all closed up and you're not exchanging much gases with the environment because you don't want to lose your water, and you have photosynthesis going on, that's going to draw down the CO2 because you're fixing it. The oxygen is going to go up because of photophosphorylation. We're going to be releasing oxygen. So CO2 is going down, oxygen is going up, your stomata are closed, and you're making have like the perfect place for more photorespiration to happen. And so as that happens, you're going to more and more favor photorespiration. Again, I think you do not want to happen. So if CO2 is high, we're fine. We take a couple of ribulose as phosphate, a couple of CO2, we make four, three PGA, two for each one of these that we do. If CO2 is low, again, we're going to run this twice. We use oxygen, we get three PGA out of there, but then we lose a CO2. Remember, we're going to get one CO2 because it took two phosphoglycolate to uh, get that CO2. So 
some plants have developed ways, actually, essentially all plants have different mechanisms to reduce the amount of photorespiration that happens. You don't want to be doing this. Plants that live in hot environments have to do that even more. Because they don't want to lose water and exchange gases all the time, they have devised ways in which they can go about this differently. And one of the major ways is using what's known as a C4 pathway. The C4 pathway is going to use a different enzyme, at least initially. It still uses Rubisco down the line, but initially it's going to use a different enzyme to initially fix CO2 that doesn't have the same properties that Rubisco does. Rubisco does. It doesn't have the same affinity for oxygen. And so it can still fix carbon dioxide at low carbon dioxide um, at low carbon dioxide concentrations. There's actually a lot of plants that we commonly know that do this. For instance, corn does this, and sugar does this. Dandelions do this. Crabgrass does this. Almost any plant that you can think of from a hot environment is going to do this. But also some from just like semi-arid. Wheat is C4 or C3. Corn is C4. Kind of an interesting thing is that almost all, this is kind of a little aside, almost all carbon that you end up eating either comes from eventually, like if you, if you follow back to where it was initially fixed, it was probably either fixed initially by corn or wheat. It doesn't, doesn't really matter how where that goes. Like even, even if you are like exclusively carnivorous, well, the things that you were eating probably ate corn or wheat at some 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 level back. And it's kind of interesting because corn and wheat, because they fix carbon dioxide the same way, they actually select for different isotope ratios uh, of carbon 13 versus carbon 12. And you can actually tell how much of your diet is based on corn or how much of it's based on wheat far back if you take like a piece of your hair and like look at the ratios of carbon stable isotopes. Majority eating corn, or even majority eating kind of interesting thing, um, and it varies. Like in different places in the U.S. or different countries, that ratio <coughs> changes a lot. How much you're eating corn, how much you're eating something else. And for me, I look like I'm eating corn because I majority eat sugar cane. But that's okay, yeah. So, how does this work? What happens is we actually take CO2 plus phosphoenyl pyruvate, so a one carbon molecule plus a three carbon molecule, and make oxaloacetate, which is a four carbon molecule. And therefore, this is called C4 because the CO2 is not fixed into a three carbon molecule, but we're fixing it into a four carbon molecule, therefore, a C4. I have no sugar. I wonder what coffee is. I want coffee is C4 or C3. Or tea is tea. C3 or C4. It's probably not a large amount of the carbon. Well, coffee by itself, yes, yeah. it is. Yes. Yeah, if you eat, just drink coffee, it has negligible amounts of sugar in there. But there's no coffee in there, which fix carbon somehow. And so either C3 or C4. So I'm curious. If you if you got all all of your I don't know. Yes. No, I do not. I would guess it's actually probably a sweet that you know, but I don't know. Yeah, that's something to ask Dr. Branica. Or Dr. Craig, not I. <laughs> Okay, so so how we do that? What what is the enzyme that does this? I'm sure you're all really <laughs> interested in this. It is Pepco, or sometimes just referred to Pepsi. Uh, it has a high affinity for CO2, and is phosphoenol pyruvate carboxylase, uh, and therefore it can bind CO2 at really low CO2 concentrations. Now, the problem with this is it's going to take a little bit more ATP and NADP to actually run this system. So it's more energetically expensive than running C3 in an ideal world, 
where you had all CO2 and no oxygen. Well, ideal for the plant, not for us. That's not an ideal world. Um, but it still is better than running C3 where you have the problems of really high oxygen and really low, low CO2. So <laughs> it's more energetically expensive to fix CO2 this way, but only when you consider having low levels or negligible levels of photorespiration happen. Once you start having high levels of photorespiration, well then this C4 becomes much more energetically advantageous. So in some ways, the interesting thing about the C4 pathway is that it's partially an anatomical adaptation. Like we're actually having anatomy solve this problem for us. Yes, we are using uh, Pepsi to, to solve our problems of high carbon dioxide. That sounds so weird out of context. I need, or low carbon dioxide, we need more carbon dioxide, so let's get some Pepsi. Um, yeah. So, what we're going to do is we're going to allow, we're going to get high CO2 in certain parts of the plant. And that's going to be in mesophyll cells. Hold on a second. That should be the opposite way. Okay. So we're going to allow low CO2, excuse me, low CO2 in certain parts of the cells, in certain parts of the plant, in mesophyll cells. And then in bundle sheet cells, we are going to have. And in those mesophyll cells, we'll have the C4 enzymes. In bendel sheath cells, we are going to have our C3 enzymes. And we're going to keep the CO2 really high in the bundle sheath cells. And so here we're going to have the C3 enzymes. We're going to have no photosystem 1, only, or no photosystem 2, only photosystem 1. So remember, photosystem 2 is where we have the oxygen involvement complex, which splits water into carbon dioxide plus oxygen, or excuse me, protons plus oxygen. Yeah, splitting water into carbon dioxide would be real big. You'd be making carbon definitely. Yeah, you definitely would. Um, so you split the water into protons plus an oxygen. So we don't have that in the bundle sheet cells. And so we have no oxygen being produced in the bundle sheet cells. So here's essentially how this works. In the mesophyll cells, we have CO2 coming in and that CO2 is going to react with phosphoenolpyruvate. We are going to make oxaloacetate. So it goes to an intermediate here where it turns into bicarbonate with carbonic hydrate, so that's a little bit to the side of one. Um, so we have phosphoenolpyruvate, we have Pepsi here that then makes oxaloacetate. We then take the oxaloacetate. And it goes into the chloroplast here of the mesophyll cell, and we make malate, uh, malate right here uh, through NADP uh, malate dehydrogenase. We make malate or malic acid, depending on if the protein is not. That malate then is going to then be taken into the bundle sheath cell. Here we have another enzyme that's going to take the malate, turn it into pyruvate and we get the CO2 out. And then that CO2 can just go through the Calvin cycle, just like normal. So it's not like we are completely replacing the normal Calvin cycle, like the normal C3 pathway. We are just putting it, like we're, we're caging it up into the bundle sheath cells of the plant. So it is being physically separated from where we're doing the initial fixation of carbon dioxide, which is happening in the mesophyll cells here. And we were using a different enzyme to do the initial uh, fixation. So it's, it's, it's not so much like a replacement, it's like an add-on to C3. It's not like completely replacing the C3 pathway. And so eventually, we it's just a way of getting CO2 from here to here, and then keeping CO2 really high in these bundle sheath cells. Because here, we can keep the carbon, the carbon dioxide really high, we can keep oxygen really low, and so Calvin cycle can operate without having to deal with photorespiration. 
No, the Calvin cycle does not make O2 on O2. It is using carbon dioxide. The thing that makes O2 is the first step of the electron transport chain that's happening in the chloroplast uh, photosystem too. And you have the oxygen evolving complex, which uses the energy from light uh, and the electrons, but we're replacing those electrons by splitting water into a couple protons, plus an oxygen, and using those protons or those electrons to replace what we lost from the P60, 680, and you get the oxygen. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, let me know. I'm happy to, to explain. It makes perfect sense. <laughs> okay. I will take your word for that. Uh, just to kind of let you know, here's what we have going on. If you have a cross section of a plant, of a plant leaf here, down here the stomata, and you have these, these chambers in here that allow gas to move in and out. So outside the cell, or outside the leaf and inside the leaf. All of these green cells here are mesophyll cells. Essentially, they're just kind of like the the bulk cells of all of all of this. The purple here are the, the bundle sheath cells. They're actually around, um, these are around different uh, vessels. So what we have here is, come in here, in here, in all these green cells, we have the, the C4 enzymes. And so these are the ones that are coming in contact with um, the atmosphere here in these chambers. Once these close, CO2 is going to be going down, O2 is going to be going up, and these are the cells that are in contact with that. So they will fix CO2 using Pepsi rather than Rubisco, and essentially transport via malate. Malate dehydrogenase is going to convert the oxaloacetate to malate, take the malate into the bundle sheath cells, and then we're gonna have another enzyme that is gonna take the malate, turn it into pyruvate, and we are going to get out CO2 there. And once we have the CO2, now we have in these bundle sheath cells really high CO2 because we keep pumping it in there through malate. We keep all the oxygen out because they're not performing photosynthesis with photosystem two, and we can run Calvin cycle normally without having to worry about that. So basically, we're just acting, just acting to trap CO2 and pass it to the C3 pathway as essentially an add-on. So C4 separates this in, in, in physical space. We have our mesophyll cells, we have our bundle sheath, sheath cells, and we're separating the fixation of the CO2 and the actual Calvin cycle in physical space. That's not the only way to do that. Um, so we also have CAM plants. This is crassulasing and acid metabolism. This is another kind of add-on but instead of doing this, separating this out in space, they separate out in time. And so they are going to be operating these two different pathways differently in time. So we're gonna separate CO2 uptake and C3, the Calvin cycle, in time rather than space. So here's how this happens. In the night, when you can keep, when it's not hot outside, you can just open up your, um, uh, your stomata and just let tons of CO2 come in and let your oxygen go out. We're going to run essentially the same thing here. We're going to take carbon dioxide, use Pepsi to make oxaloacetate, and then we use malate dehydrogenase to make malate, and then we are going to store it in a vacuum. And actually, it's, it's malic acid and malate in here, and depending on, I mean, we're also pumping in some protons, and so it mostly turns into malic acid in this case. Um, so that is what is happening during the night. Essentially, we're grabbing all the CO2 that we can while we have our stomata open and let the just the great CO2 flood in, let the horrible oxygen flood out. Then during the day when it's hot, you can close off your stomata, and normally you would be having CO2 dropping, oxygen rising inside the cell, but instead they, they allow the malate to come back out of these vacuoles we're converting it back into oxaloacetate, back into Pepsi. We're essentially running this in reverse, making CO2. And that CO2 now can run through the Calvin cycle. So we can keep carbon dioxide high now by taking this reservoir of malate, running the system backwards, and rising up CO2 in the, uh, in the cell. So 
In this way, we are separating out the actual fixation, the initial fixation of carbon dioxide, and the usage of Calvin cycle in time rather than in space. But essentially, it's doing the same thing. Are there any questions on that? Okay, just really brief in the last 30 seconds. That is the last of the stuff for the test, which means I have no new, that's the end of photosynthesis. What we're going to do is, for Wednesday, it will just be test review in here. And I will be here to answer all your questions, especially since I will not be here to do the test. So I will be here for test review on Wednesday during class time. I'm not going to launch the next unit quite yet. Are there any questions about that? Okay. Yes. Is there a quiz this week? Um, yes, there will be a quiz this week. I haven't gotten up yet. It will go up probably tonight or tomorrow, and it won't be due until test time on Friday. Yeah. Okay. Have a good day. Yes.